Hi class, we're going to talk about the electrical activity of the heart in more detail in this presentation. As we look at the sinoatrial node or the pacemaker node of the heart, once it's depolarized, that signal is going to stimulate the two atria to contract nearly simultaneously. We just say at the same time, although there's a couple millisecond lag between them. Once the one once the signal depo, once that AV node depolarizes, excuse me, the SA node depolarizes, the AV node is going to be stimulated approximately 50 milliseconds or 1 20th of a second later. And at that AV node, the signal is going to slow down and it slows down because there's very few gap junctions at the intercalated discs of the AV node. And those very thin cardiomyocytes with few gap junctions means that it takes more time for enough ions to flow from one cell to the next cell and depolarize that next cell. And that delays the signal about one tenth of a second. And that one tenth of a second or 100 milliseconds is just enough time for the ventricles to fill with blood while those atria are contracting. Now, as we look at the signals, once that signal gets through the AV bundle, it's going to go very, very quickly through the rest of the conducting network, that subendothelial conducting network. And that we're going to have the signal go down the AV bundle um, to the bundle branches, to those Purkinje fibers, and those Purkin from the Purkinje, excuse me, blah, 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 from the Purkinje fibers, nearly the entirety of the ventricles, the left and right ventricles, are going to depolarize at the same time. That muscle that makes up the ventricles depolarizes in unison or at the same time. Now, remember, systole means contraction, distally means, or diastole, uh, potato, potato, means relaxation. So when we look at ventricular systole, it starts at the apex of the heart and then moves upward. And remember, we several recordings ago, we talked about the spiral fiber or the spiral arrangement of the cardiomyocytes. That spiral arrangement causes the ventricles to twist like we're wringing out water from a dish towel. And in this case, we're wringing the blood out of the heart. Ultimately, it helps to maximize the amount of blood output. Let's camp on this slide for a while. There's a lot of stuff, a lot of good stuff happening here. So let's look at these first two. Uh, we are these two colors. We have green and red for the two lines. The red line represents myocardial contraction or contractile force. So when we look at the, the amount of tension on the cardiomyocyte, uh, the individual cardiomyocyte is going to contract and then stop contracting and then relax again. So that, you know, that makes sense. It gets, it, it pulls and then it relaxes. It has an increase in tension and then a decrease in tension. So when we look at the red, think of the myo, the cardiomyocyte tension. And then when we look at the green line, I want you to think of the electrical activity, the membrane potential of a stereotypical cardiomyocyte. So as we look at stereotypical cardiomyocyte, uh, resting membrane potential is at about, way down here, at about negative 90-ish millivolts. And when it depolarizes, or when it reaches threshold, we have sodium voltage-gated channels open. And then as those sodium voltage-gated channels open, we have sodium rushing in, and the, the voltage of the membrane goes up dramatically. So sodium influx or is going to cause even more ch sodium ion channels to open and the voltage of the cardiomyocyte skyrockets from about negative 90 to about positive 30 millivolts. And at that positive 30 millivolts, this phase right here, we're going to have the sodium voltage gated channels close and it's worth emphasizing here that we're still going to have calcium ions entering the cell. These calcium ions are slowly going into the cell through slow calcium voltage gated channels. And this, as, as we have calcium rushing in, we are going to have some potassium flowing out. So we have calcium, I'm gonna, I'm gonna say CA for calcium, we have calcium going in. Well, we have 
potassium going out. And because we have a, just a, a trickle of calcium ions moving in right now, that is going to help offset the rapid efflux of potassium ions out of the cell. So we're gaining some positive charges and losing some positive charges from the inside of the cell at the same time. The net result is that we have a plateau in our voltage. And it plateaus pretty quickly or for about one ten, one fifth of a second, so about two tenths of a second here, it'll plateau. And then as the calcium voltage gated channels start to close off, typically at about this voltage right here at about zero millivolts, those calcium voltage gated channels close, the calcium can no longer offset the change in voltage from the potassium rushing out, and then we have the steep drop in voltage because now we're just having rapid efflux of potassium ions. Well, we are no longer adding calcium and instead getting the calcium out of the cell. And as those pot potassium ions rush out at that negative 90-ish millivolts, once we get back to the resting potential, the potassium voltage-gated channels close and then we rely on that wonderful, that amazing sodium potassium pump to reestablish the initial ion concentrations. Now, as we're looking at the electrical activity of the heart, it can be monitored with an electrocardiogram, sometimes referred to as an ECG um, or an EKG. And the K is because the, the word in German that means heart or cardio starts with a K. And the in individual that initially invented the device was German. So EKG has just been embedded in the literature um, since this, init this technology initially arrived. And if we take all the action potentials of all the different cells of the heart and combine them together, we can get, excuse me, this classic, this stereotypical pattern for our EKG. We typically are going to take electrodes and put them on the arms, legs, and chest and combine everything together. And as we're looking at this, we have the initial bump here, referred to as the P wave. And then we have the QRS complex in the middle. And then at the very end, we have our T wave. And the individual who performed the first electrocardiogram was a very intelligent individual. He had enough forethought to say, hey, my technology is pretty crude. And this was in the late 1800s when the first EKG was performed. I'm willing to bet that as my technology improves, the shape of my EKG will change. So the individual who came up with this technology chose letters that were in the middle of the alphabet to name the peaks so that there were letters before and letters after available to continue naming any subsequent peaks that were found. Now, as we look at this figure, from the beginning of the P wave to the beginning of the QRS complex, we call that the PR interval, and then from the beginning of the QRS complex to the end of the T wave, we had the QT interval. And this P wave typically is going to correspond with the atria contracting, whereas the QT interval typically will correspond to the ventricles contracting. So let's talk about this in more detail. First, we have that little P wave, that little bump at the beginning. The P wave corresponds to the SA node firing and the atria depolarizing. And depolarization is another way of saying contracting. So during the P wave, right here at step number one, the atria begin to contract for our P wave. And then we'll have the QRS for the next stage on our Hmm. I'm having a brain hiccup. EKG, electrocardiogram. It's right up there on the top. Good, goodness gracious. So as we look at our QRS complex, the QRS complex uh, is going to correspond to ventricular depolarization, aka ventricular contraction. So once we start this QRS complex right here, we're now going to have the ventricles just beginning to depolarize. It's also worth emphasizing that during the QRS complex, ventricular depolarization, if we look back up at the atria, 
the atria are now repolarizing. And when we think of repolarization, I want you to think relaxation. So while the atria are contracting, blood will get pushed into the ventricles. And then while the ventricles are contracting, the atria are relaxing. Now, that QRS complex, you know, it looks kind of funny that, you know, we have a little down spike, a big up spike, and then a slightly bigger down spike. The complex shape is due to the thick myocardium on the left ventricle and the thin myocardium of the right ventricle, the, the varying thicknesses of the two ventricles. In between the QRS complex and the T, beginning of the T wave, we have the ST segment. That ST segment is going to correspond to ventricular systole, so the complete contraction of our ventricles. And then we are going to have the T wave at the end. This T wave right here corresponds to a wave of depolarization. Excuse me, a wave of re with an R, repolarization. So the T wave corresponds to relaxation of the ventricles. So when you think of repolarization with an R, I want you to think of relaxation with an R. <coughs> now, as we look at this process, the cardiac cycle is going to be described by this contraction, relaxation, this filling and ejection of blood from the heart. And it can be defined as one complete contraction and then relaxation of all four chambers of the heart. That is our cardiac cycle. Now, in terms of the cardiac cycle, there's two variables that govern fluid movement. We need the pressure and the that pushes it and the resistance that opposes it. And when we look at fluids, um, the big take home is that fluids will always flow from an area of higher pressure to an area of lower pressure, whether that fluid is a liquid or that fluid is a gas. So, Fluids flow from the high pressure point to the low pressure point. You should put a star next to this one. This is a very important take home idea. Now, in terms of measuring the fluid pressures in our body, we use a sphygmomanometer. Um, most people just call it the blood pressure cuff, but the technical name is sphygmomanometer, and it's traditionally been measured in millimeters of mercury. Millimeters of mercury um, is an old school unit of measurement because the initial sphygmal manometers depended on a column of mercury suspended in an airtight tube that was then partially submerged in a pool of mercury. And as air pressure increased and pushed down on it more, the column of mercury inside of the tube would rise up higher. And then we would measure how many millimeters the mercury rose above the surface of the mercury in the pool, and that's why we use millimeters of mercury. Um, just for a reference point, one atmosphere of pressure is defined as 760 millimeters of mercury. So as these pressure gradients are going to work through the heart, we are going to first have the atria contract. And as those atria contract, and we're gonna, we can focus on the left side of the heart in this figure, or in our, this slide. So let's re, let's re set up our frame of reference. Let's focus on the ventricles on the left side. When the ventricles on the left side of the heart relax, so right here, when this guy is relaxing, the atria is contracting. So we have higher pressure in the left atria, lower pressure down here in the left ventricle, and will ultimately have fluid flowing into the left ventricle. That is going to cause the left AV valve, AKA the mitral valve. That's a really old school name right there, super old school name, left AV valve. So when you think mitral valve, think left AV valve. That left AV valve opens and blood flows into the left ventricle. And then our left ventricle contracts. And as that left ventricle contracts, blood will flow backwards and hit the left AV 
valve and the left AV valve snap shut. The bicuspid valve or left AV valve snap shut. And then the blood is redirected to the aortic valve or aortic semilunar valve, pushes it open, and the blood will flow out of the aorta to the rest of the body. And then this process is going to continue. It's worth emphasizing that in order for there to be for this left AV valve to snap shut, we need to have low pressure in the left atria and high pressure in the left ventricle. And that snaps the left AV valve shut. And when we look at the aortic valve, the aortic semilunar valve, the pressure of blood in the left ventricle needs to be greater than the blood pressure pushing backwards through the aorta. And once we have more pressure in the left ventricle than the aorta, the blood will force the aortic valve open and the blood can flow out through the aorta. Or to summarize, blood flows from an area of high pressure to an area of low pressure. Now, as these heart valves are opening and closing, they make noises. And to review from the very first presentation given last semester, you can listen to the body to figure out what's going on. That is known as osculation, listening to gain medical information. That first sound we make, S1, at, um, S sub 1 for first sound, is louder and longer. And the reason that one's louder and longer is because it corresponds to those AV valves snapping shut. And then there's going to be some turbulence in the bloodstream. And if you have a really good sense of hearing and you're listening to somebody with a stethoscope while their heart is pumping, you can hear that some people can differentiate the sounds of the AV valve snapping shut from the turbulence, the sound of the blood gushing and moving against the heart wall and then also flowing out of the pulmonary trunk and aortic ascending aorta. The second sound, S sub 2, is softer as the semilunar valves uh, snap shut. So the dub is going to be a little bit more quieter compared to the sound of the lub, primarily because instead of having those muscles right next to the valves, forcing them shut, forcing the, the AV valve shut. We're instead going to have latent blood pressure forcing the semilunar valve shut. And that's going to make the noise a little bit quieter because there's a little bit less of a pressure gradient set up. And then we have S sub 3. This S sub 3 is a very difficult one to hear. Um, if you're over the age of 30, you, can, um, you typically aren't going to have the best circulation anymore, but for individuals under the age of 30, you can every once in a while hear the left AV valve opening and filling the left ventricle, but that's uncommon. So, oh, there's a lot on this figure. We can camp on this one for a while. Let's look at ventricular filling. Ventricular filling it occurs during ventricular distally and is going to occur when those AV valves are open. So here we have in blue and green ventricular filling. So during ventricular filling, we are going to have blood rushing into the ventricles and ventricular filling will begin between S2 and S1. And at the end or halfway through Excuse me, ventricular filling begins between S2 and S1. <laughs> I need to get my cheater glasses on. That's an S3 right there. Halfway through ventricular filling, you can hear the S3 noise. It's a very faint murmur. Now, if the ventricles are filling with blood, that means that the ventricular pressure is going to be low. And there, we need that low ventricular pressure relative to the atrial pressure and the aortic pressure so that blood will rush into the ventricles, causing the ventricles to fill. And as the ventricles fill, the amount of fluid in them increases. So the ventricular fluid volume goes up. At the very end of filling the ventricles, we are going to have the end diastolic 
volume. Remember, distally is relaxation. And when the ventricles are done relaxing, they are going to have a certain amount of blood in them known as the end diastolic volume. And generally speaking, on average, it's about 130 milliliters of blood for a typical adult. And then we're going to have the next phase, the isovolumetric contraction phase. Let's camp on this word for a second here. Iso means same. Volume, well, means volume. And so during an isovolumetric contraction, we have the same volume of blood, but now instead of relaxing, it's contracting. It's at the very, very beginning of systole. And at that split second at the beginning of systole, shown here in bright yellow, we have isovolumetric contractions. The ventricle just starts to contract. There's a ginormous spike in blood pressure within the ventricle, but no blood has left the ventricle yet. I'm going to clear the screen here for a second. So at the beginning, well, we have the pressure of the ventricle skyrocketing, the volume of the ventricle remains the same. And then as the pressure continues to go up, eventually the pressure is going to overpower the blood, the force of blood flowing backwards through the semilunar valves, and the blood will rush out of the aorta and the pulmonary trunk. In addition, during isovolumetric contraction, or excuse me, during this isovolumetric contraction phase, when the ventricles just start to contract, the AV valves snap shut. And as those AV valves snap shut, we get the S1 sound, the lub, the louder sound. And let's look at the changes in pressure here. We have a very sharp increase in pressure. Um, so we have, a sh over a small period of time, a dramatic increase in pressure that's going to give us a loud lub. And when we look at S2, the dub, the pressure decrease phase is a longer period of time than the pressure increase phase. So the pressure decreases slower than it increases, so the semilunar valves snap shut slower than the AV valves are snapped shut. So the S2 noise is going to be not as loud as that S1 noise. Now during the ventricular ejection phase, this is when blood is leaving the heart. Uh, typically the ventricles are not going to eject all of the blood that's within them. They'll eject most, but not all. The stroke volume is the amount of blood that the ventricles eject with one contraction. So the end diastolic volume on average is about 130 milliliters. The stroke volume on average is 70 milliliters. And the percentage of blood that leaves that ventricle with one contraction is called the ejection fraction. So 70 divided by 130 gives us an ejection fraction of about 54% percent of the end diastolic volume. That leftover blood that is still in the ventricle after the ventricle is done contracting, after the ventricle is done with systole, is called the end systolic volume. And if we take 130 minus 70, we get 60 milliliters of blood on average for the end systolic volume. And then we're going to have the isovolumetric relaxation phase. And then isovolumetric relaxation phase is the very last phase here, shown in purple. This isovolumetric relaxation phase is going to correspond to blood from the aorta and pulmonary trunk flowing backwards and snapping the semilunar valve shut, causing that S2 noise, that dub. Now it's worth, as we look at this, iso meaning same, volumetric meaning the amount of blood, and then relaxation. So the heart, the ventricles have just started to relax, but the amount, they haven't started receiving any blood. And as they continue to relax, the pressure on them drops low enough that blood starts to rush in, and we go back to the beginning, ventricular filling, and this process just keeps repeating itself over and over and over again.
as we look at the cardiac cycle in a resting person, so somebody that's relaxed, atrial systole contraction of the atria lasts for about a tenth of a second, ventricular systole lasts for about three tenths of a second, and then there's the quiescent period. This is when a brief period of time when all chambers are in diastole. So this is the fraction of a second when the entire heart is relaxing and recovering from all the work it just did. And that's about four tenths of a second. So if we take one tenth plus three tenths plus four tenths, we have eight tenths of a second for a typical cardiac cycle, which gives us a resting heart rate in a typical adult of 75 beats per minute. I know this was a long recording. Um, I apologize for that. There's lots here to chew on. If you have any questions or comments, please feel free to post on the class discussion board or to shoot me an email. And as always, happy studies.